morning, everybody. Welcome in to Freight Waves Now on this Wednesday morning. I'm Kayla Nix. Joining me is Anthony Smith. That's right. Now, on today's episode, we'll talk about what's going on in freight marketing with Blythe Brumleaf. Also put someone in our hot seat. And we'll talk about the function of a CEO's role during harder economic times. But our first top story of the day focuses on reshoring and how it may be more than just a trend. Borderland writers Noe Mahoney joins us now to talk about this study that really kind of focuses on this more than a trend coming up right now. And Noe, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. So let's get right into it. Obviously, it's no secret that more companies are looking to bring their manufacturing processes either back here into the United States or just in North America in general. But we've got a new report released. Who released this report and what does it tell us? Uh, the report uh, is from a company called Zometry uh, in partnership with uh, Forbes. And they did a survey of uh, manufacturing CEOs and asking them questions about, you know, nearshoring, uh, moving operations back to, you know, North America, and also, you know, how will they be invest, how will they be investing in stuff such as, you know, automation and robotics. And no, it was going to be one of the biggest things that really seemed to be the focal point or the really the focus on throughout this interview that really kind of kept popping up, if anything. Uh, well, one of the questions in the survey was, uh, you know, how many CEOs are considering reshoring or nearshoring their manufacturing operations back to, you know, either Mexico or even the United States or other parts of the Americas. And 64% of the CEO surveyed said they are considering, uh, you know, nearshoring, reshoring, you know, moving operations back here to, to the Americas. And it's super interesting to hear that it's that big of a percentage, right? And obviously, we know we see a lot of production in the auto industry moving back to Mexico, a lot of electronic goods being produced in Mexico and shipped here to the United States. What other industries are really looking at the opportunity to reshore? Uh, we have, you know, uh, as you mentioned, automotive, uh, aerospace is another one that seems to be gaining a lot of traction uh, in Mexico. You have um, uh, all kinds of... Uh, Printed circuit boards, you know, uh, electronics and that kind of nature. You have EVs. Um, so there's there's all different uh, types of uh, wide range of manufacturing goods that seem to be uh, moving back to the Americas. And no, it was going to be some of the biggest, I guess, advantages of being able to nearshore, reshore here in North America and some parts of Latin America compared to um, Asia. Uh, you know, one of the biggest is uh, cost of manufacturing, which, you know, includes labor uh, and shipping. Um, another is obviously proximity to your uh, end, end consumers. You know, your biggest market is the United States. Uh, it makes really good sense or it helps to have your manufacturing operations in Mexico or even Canada, somewhere close to, you know, your, your biggest customers. Uh, another one is, you know, USMCA helps with uh, tariffs for Mexican-made goods or Canadian-made goods. So that, that helps also with cost uh, compared to, you know, U U.S. and China right now. They're still having some trade tensions, and there's tariffs on a lot of goods coming from China. And another big one is, you know, avoidance of any political conflicts we have with China or other, other countries. Uh, you know, when those conflicts happen, it can affect, you know, the supply chain. So if your supply chain is here somewhere in North America, you can avoid those types of things. No, one of the really interesting things that mentioned in your article is that it feels like people have a really kind of rosy outlook about the ability to reshort in Mexico, but there's actually some pretty significant headwinds facing that, especially when it comes to cross-border trade. You mentioned, of course, increased regulation. You've got more border crossing inspections at the border. We've got a weaker peso now starting to worry about. So break down this, break this down a little bit, and what, what are some things to be concerned about? Uh, obviously, as you mentioned, some of the uh, the weakening of the, the peso in Mexico, which could affect labor costs, and uh, you have, you know, these sort of things going on in Texas where the Texas governor sometimes does these uh, operations of in, in what he calls enhanced inspections, which slows down, you know, goods from the possible, which, which can disrupt, you know, supply chains. Um, and you also have, you know, I think some people wonder if, 
you know, too much is moving to Mexico too quickly, and is there enough um, labor, skilled labor, to be able to handle all of these, you know, new factories that are popping up or are new factories that are predicted to uh, to be moving to Mexico next year? So those are some of the, the possible headwinds against, you know, nearshoring in Mexico. And that's going to be around some of my next questions for you, Noy. We're looking at the infrastructure getting built out. That's going to be a huge aspect of this all um, happening and really being able to be rolled out. Do you see any kind of timeline right now for really how fast or really how much of a ramp up there can be in warehouse construction and really being able to see an impact in this nearshoring or reshoring attempt? Um, you know, I think Mexico has the ability to ramp up pretty quickly. Um, one of the things I think is interesting about Mexico is the government has been very proactive, or this and this administration currently in Mexico has been proactive in trying to make sure they have enough skilled labor um, for all of these factories, and they they're trying to reach out to uh, you know or increase the number of like technical schools, what we call technical schools here in the United States, and creating programs with universities, uh, partnerships between universities and manufacturers to make sure they have enough engineers uh, coming out of school to fill all of these positions. So that's one part of the infrastructure question. And I think Mexico, they're very proactive also in uh, building projects, you know, building roads, building the infrastructure needed for all of the increased manufacturing that they're hoping will come their way. So, Noy, if a CEO is looking at, at their options for the next year, maybe, and they're talking about bringing some of these operations back here to the Americas, what's that first step in reshoring? Is it kind of restructuring your supply chain? Is it figuring out where your land use can be and then your cross-border trade, the new laws? What, what's that step number one? I think the first step would be reaching out to either someone uh, in the, the Mexican government or what, what there's a lot of what we call uh, tax shelter companies. Um, and these are private companies, but they help you know, manufacturers. Um, the manufacturer will go and tell these companies, you know, we wanna make this product uh, and we wanna be able to ship it you know, to the United States or Canada. And so what happens is these companies, these tax shelter companies will, will tell them, well, this is the, the best location. This location has you know, the most available labor that would be able to work in your factories. Uh, so they, they try to help them, you know, sort of figure out what, what the need is and where the best location would be for some of these uh, companies. Question. No, wait, last question for you here. When you're weighing the options between moving things to Mexico or moving things even back here in the United States, do you think that there's a benefit one over the other, or is it really just going to be dependent on your business and where you're willing to spend the capital? Um, you know, I, I think it benefits uh, all of us in some sense, uh, if the supply chain is located here in the, the Americas, whether it's you know Canada, the U.S., or Mexico, um, the cost of shipping is going to be lower. It should be lower. Uh, the cost of labor will be uh, more advantageous to companies to be here, uh, and it also, uh, I I think it would lower the, the carbon footprint of you know supply chains instead of shipping things you know thousands of miles across the ocean, um, which has the potential to, you know, increase, you know, what they call greenhouse gases. If your supply chain is here in the Americas, I think it reduces carbon footprint of our of our industry, of, you know, the trading industry. Great point there, Noy. Maybe there can be some kind of crossover collab with Noy and uh, Net Zero fun. Carbon. Yeah, Who knows? Yeah. I, I, like, I like that aspect. <laughs> Noy, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. You can head on over to FreightWaves.com to read that and more in Noise Borderlands articles that come out every single week. We're going to head on over to The Wall. We've got our first carrier update with Tony Mulvey and Donnie Gilbert. Welcome into this carrier update. I'm Tony, joined by Donnie. Donnie, going to... It's Wednesday. You know, talking about the, what's going on in the reefer market. Yesterday, we kind of yeah, touched we were, on the dry we off market. Monday, so we're going back up and go back to the reefer markets because I believe they're just as important. Mm -hmm. And there's a few things going on here that's, that's kind of a little bit interesting just as well. <clears throat> so 
I've got pulled up a three-year history course. This is 2023. Mm -hmm. So now my three-year history is 2020, 21, and 22. But starting at right here, this orange line, this is 2019, and it goes into 2020. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this blue line that ends right around here, this is where we are today. Yep. And as you see, kind of similar to the drive-in, you see this gap here shrinking as we get closer and closer to December uh, during this past year. And then of course, right here in December, it's been negative. You see it below and that's kind of worrisome. And here uh, now, right now we're in this drop period. This is our holiday period where we have a couple zero days that average in because it's a seven day roll on average. But when we rebound, what are we going to see now? We're going to see a little bit of a peak right here in January, and then we're going to see it start to trend down. But are we going to be above or below this orange line? I'm yeah. worried that we're going to be below it. That's kind of my concern, especially because we're below it now. And right, so if this would have been yesterday's data, right, which is last Tuesday, compare, I mean, look at back a week. We've taken off all the impacts of what you would think Christmas is. Now we're just showing the impacts of New Year's because we're seven days after what coming back from the Christmas holiday. So, I mean, you're, that's where you see that uptick start. But, I mean, we're still below those levels, right? And I think that's my concern is yeah. we didn't come back as maybe as strong as we did in some of the other years. And, of course, we'll see in, or, uh, not inventory, freight volumes at the beginning here as we return versus the end of the month, we are going to be below. It's going to go down. And then in February, it's going to be close mm -hmm. because in February, we actually start to get some movement started. Uh, Valentine's Day. Yep. So some roses, but also we get some a little bit of of uh, peak season uh, produce starting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is going to be freight uh, that's moving in from South America, because obviously you think about it, they're a lot further down, close to the equator. It's going to start getting a lot warmer. Their growing season starts a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see those uh, February volumes start coming in, maybe to the port of Miami, port of Jacksonville. It's going to start moving into Florida that ways. Mm -hmm. And then of course in March we're going to start seeing. Uh, produce coming in from uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. as, it, as, that, as that layer starts to, to move up, that heat starts yep. to move up, those growing season will kick in. And then of course, as we get on into uh, May and June, July, you'll start seeing it in the US as we really hit that, that big bang. So <clears throat> we're going to see probably this is gonna be pretty normal right up to about March right here. Of course, we're gonna exclude this big jump right here. From here on, this is not good information to follow. Yep. Uh, where we go from here is gonna be interesting. Uh, is it how, how is it going to be impacted? Are we going to be above or below this orange line? Tony? Absolutely. It's something to pay attention to in the coming months. Well, Donnie, thank you so much for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you again a little later. Right now, we'll hand it back over to Kaylee Nix. Thanks, guys, for that first carrier update. We got a first look at our top stories on FreightWaves.com this morning. More details are emerging about United Furniture Inc.'s financial health leading up to the company's decision to close its doors right before Thanksgiving. Wells Fargo Bank has submitted a petition to force the company into Chapter 7 bankruptcy and filed a 377-page emergency motion seeking the appointment of an interim trustee for UFI. Wells Fargo says that UFI management contacted the bank with little prior notice on the same day that the company closed that the company was asking for substantial capital in order to keep running. The closure affected more than 2,700 employees and drivers who were all notified of their termination either by email or text message. The benchmark diesel price moved up yesterday following, following seven straight weeks of declines as retail prices finally started reacting to higher futures and wholesale numbers. However, just as that pump price moved up, diesel futures posted one of the biggest declines since July. The weekly DOE price came in at $4.58, up 4.6%. This is still about 80 cents less than the highest price seen back in October of this year. The upward tick follows an increase in the price of ultra-low sulfur diesel on the CME Commodity Exchange of more than 57 cents per gallon during the last month of 2022. And the Surface Transportation Board has ordered Union Pacific to fix its service issues raised by customer Foster Poultry Farms in California. Foster Farms filed a petition for emergency service before the board last week, noting continued service declines and the STB response calls for UP to deliver specific train sets of animal feed to Foster Farms on a time schedule specified by the railroad. The schedule will help prevent a significant loss of livestock in California, according to the Surface Transportation Board. 
You can find details of these stories and more up on FreightWaves.com and in our FreightWaves app. If you're watching us live on YouTube, give us a like and subscribe to stay updated. For the full FreightWaves TV experience, head on over to tv.freightwaves.com. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with a first check of weather and Zach Strickland is here in studio. Don't go away. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's gonna happen with inflation. Is there gonna be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation gonna be here? When is there gonna be inflation? What's gonna happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. Welcome back to Freight Waves Now. It's time for our first check of the weather here on your Wednesday morning. Still watching a pretty substantial line of severe storms march across the deep south this morning, all the way from south central Georgia, the panhandle of Florida, and up along the Atlantic coast into south and north Carolina. So let's check it out in sonar critical events. We saw some pretty intense rainfall, some minor tornadoes, as well as some intense wind damage, and some even some hail in some places yesterday across Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. Today we're watching that severe weather move through the south eastern pieces of Georgia. Because of that, we've got a tornado watch in place for the panhandle of Florida that does include Tallahassee in the I-10 corridor there, up through I-75, I-16, out through Savannah, and then into the central parts of South Carolina. And with this, we'll be watching for some spin-up tornadoes, not expecting a huge outbreak event, but as the line of storms continues to move through, could potentially see one or two here or there. So this is what we're looking at right now, the leading edge of that storm really crossing through the Albany, Al Albany area right now, right around that I-75 corridor. If you're down to the southeast into Florida, just be prepared later on this morning. We're talking about 11 to about 1 p.m. for you guys there today. They'll be in and out pretty quickly, but with these storms, you can expect some strong gusty winds on the front side of the line. Again, can't rule out a tornado as that line continues to move through. And then on the back side of that heavy rainfall, some stronger continued winds, thunder, lightning, all of the above. So on the back side, the Atlanta Metro right now going to be dealing with some heavy rainfall that should be moving out of here in about the next hour and a half to two hours. But until then, traffic moving through North Georgia, through Atlanta, and then down to the South Southeast going to be having a tough time today. Some of those roadways are flooded. We do have some accidents there as well in the Atlanta Metro area. Because of that, we've got flood warnings in place surrounding all of Atlanta and then out along those major interstates as well. Just be careful as you're taking time across the southeast today. It's going to continue to be a little bit of a mess, especially down along the Atlantic coast through at least the evening hours of tonight. Then we'll get a little bit of a break here across the southeast and take some time to dry out for the rest of the week. We'll talk a little bit more about weather coming up later on in the show. Right now we're going to toss it back over to Anthony Smith. 
Thank you, Carrie, for that update. And right now, we're going to chat with someone that, if they're speaking, I usually listen and want to know their perspective. We have our very own Zach Strickland here in office. And Zach, it's not an impromptu freightonomic session, but more so talking about the recent changes and one of the largest 3PL players. And executive board. What do we have here? Yeah, so uh, Bob Biesterfeld, uh, been CEO at C.H. Robinson, really the nation's largest brokerage, uh, since about 2019, uh, you know, basically resigned abruptly, <laughs> which to me tells me that this has been something that has been brewing. And, and it's kind of insinuated, uh, if you looked at Freightways.com in the article here, uh, that there's been some trouble brewing here for a minute. It even said that there was somebody related to the uh, the company that said this has been in the in the works for months and it sounds like basically Bob said you know what I'm, I'm just gonna go <laughs> uh, and and that's really what I read between the lines there to take so this is a pretty big deal because CH Robinson of course the nation's largest brokerage uh, non-asset based they'd have multiple divisions though they have freight forwarding they have uh, their own asset based refrigerated that's actually how it started uh, back in the early two, uh, 1900s um, but the main focus of this business unit is the brokerage aspect <laughs> and Zach when you're looking at this situation of course there's a shift that's been happening within the freight market, whether people want to admit it or not. Is this going to be something that's more like an aspect of him really not performing or as they wanted him to, or really them not really recognizing the environment that we're in right now? Yeah, it, you know, he even comes out a few weeks, uh, yeah, it was third quarter earnings, uh, came out and said, we didn't anticipate the freight market collapsing as fast as it did. So uh, they had to announce a layoff, 650, and it said that it could have been upwards of a, uh, 1,200 uh, in the long run, uh, people laid off. and I. You know, the thing is, is like, that's okay. Uh, the market changed really abruptly. I don't feel like that is the actual reason that this happened, however, you know, because the freight market turned as fast as it's ever turned for everyone. It wasn't just C.H. Robinson. They did uh, not meet expectations, earning expectations, but a lot of people didn't meet earnings expectations uh, in the third and fourth quarter, as you well know, as we talk about on our show all the time. So uh, this to me is something that sounds like more of a, uh, you know, an environmental Thing where they just weren't getting along anymore. And when things get weird, you know, your investors and your, uh, your board members, they start asking questions, they start picking things apart. And then sometimes these CEOs don't necessarily like that. You know, this is their, this is their ship to steer and you start picking apart their game plan. And it's like, well, the environment in this situation was not anything anyone predicted. <laughs> now we were talking about it in March, <laughs> but at the same time, it, even we didn't see that it would change on a dime like it did. Right. And, and Zach, I mean, this is going to be a big one. So when they're looking at bringing in a new CEO, do you think they look in-house to say, hey, this is someone that the board can get behind and say, hey, you know what, this is going to be our player. I know whenever there's like a coaching staff change, they want their players. And so do you see this as going to be one of those things of like, hey, we're going to get one of our guys? Yeah, I, it, that's a hard call to make, uh, especially with a company the size of C.H. Robinson. You're talking about, uh, I, I think it makes sense to bring somebody from in-house that knows the operating unit uh, very well. C.H. Uh, Robinson, I think Ravi Shanker even said that, you know, they he made some comparisons to some other brokerages out there. Well, C.H. Robinson is not like any other brokerage. Uh, they're much bigger <laughs> and they've been a market share player. So what I mean by that is that they've basically been, let's make, a, let's get as much volume as we can into this business model. It's not necessarily make the hugest margins you can. Uh, it's, it's about growing just their exposure to the overall market. And that takes a unique mindset. So I don't know if pulling somebody, and maybe the board wants to pull somebody from outside of the operating unit to change that direction a little bit, because that's what it sounds like to me was the overriding concern is that maybe Bob was just operating off of this old mindset and they wanted something a little bit different, especially when you're talking about these rapidly changing environments, which you know we ourselves are talking about seeing uh, for the foreseeable future. <laughs> 
And do you think this is any kind of like a warning shot or any other executives in the industry are gonna say, hey, all right, this could happen to me as well? Or do you think this might just be a one-off event going into 2023? Uh, I don't, you know, I hate, I, I don't wanna say that it's gonna be like the start of the big <laughs> landslide of CEOs, but I think this type of environment is indicative of that. You know, when you're talking about the economic conditions that we're uh, entering right now, that we foresee going into 2023, this is just one of those challenging worlds that it, you're gonna eventually start making all these changes. Knobs are gonna get pulled. The human human nature is to react. <laughs> and I think that this is just one of probably a few more that we'll see over the next year, uh, if not, you know, into 2024 potentially, depending on how some of these uh, financial institutions and investors feel about the performance of their uh, executives, uh, because that's really what it boils down to is how much confidence do they have that they have the right person in place to navigate the choppy waters. <laughs> and that's going to be another thing. I know sometimes when there are changes in the executive team, this is almost just like a show of action that mm -hmm. not anything actually changes. It's just like, hey, we saw this happen. We got these poor results. We switched out our entire executive team. Do you think this could be just one of those things like, hey, we have to show an action <laughs> just to show that, hey, we're doing something? You know, and maybe, I don't know that the board itself needs to show an action, but certainly they have a fiduciary responsibility to the investors. <laughs> and maybe that is a kind of a signal. But to me, this one felt more like we're not getting along. Uh, yes, the volatile environment starts these discussions. They start the process of making this a situation where they don't get along anymore. Uh, but. Yes, the financial institutions don't have, or you know, the investors don't have as long of a fuse uh, as, as some of these other uh, institutions have. So it's, you know, a lot of the CEOs, one of the big things that I've talked to some of them about is having this long run vision versus the short run vision. And sometimes the investment sentiment is, I need to know, I need results now. And if they don't feel like they're getting the short-term results, sometimes they go ahead and make a quick change. But this one to me felt like they might have seen something in the long term that didn't necessarily fit with, uh, with what Bob was doing right now. I think that's a great point, and Zach. I mean, <clears throat> a lot, of course, a lot of speculation here. A lot of you know, really kind of trying to figure this out because it's recent news and uh, you know, abrupt news here. Um, but when you look at you know the industry as a whole, are there any trends that you're going to be looking for to kind of say, hey, this is going to be something that's going to be a long-term payoff or a long-term benefit for success? Yeah, I think that's going to be the key for the next year in my mind for the industry is. How, how confident are you in your model? <laughs> you know, what have you built throughout? You know, we've had two years to adapt to this highly, uh, this demand side driven economy. Uh, the consumer demand has been off the charts, as you well know. And did they build up infrastructure that kind of buffers them against what we're seeing right now, which is the beginning of a downturn in a cyclical environment. And I don't know that that's, that's, that's a very difficult ask to make of anybody is, hey, can you get the highest high and, and deal with all of this overwhelming volume, but also can you also be ready for the lowest low which is really what we're dealing with, we're, we're, it looks like we're about to deal with. And especially the transportation sector itself is already, by a lot of people's accounts, already on the floor. Our outbound tender volume index already down to where it was, close to where it was in 2019, which by a lot of people's accounts was an extremely soft year. Think about having two years of 50% more demand and then going all the way back down to where you were. That's, I, I don't know that that's a great, like. I don't know if anybody can be that buffered against that level of volatility, uh, but reactiveness, that's the key, is being able to adapt quickly. Flexibility uh, is gonna be key in anybody's business model moving forward, and we'll see that, you know, how flexible. A lot of these large carriers over the last two years, they were banking cash, they sold off their equipment at a top, that's the type of behavior that makes me think, okay, these guys are in better positions than others. And really on that last point there, I think that's a great point, really being able to be flexible, being able to pivot in these changing markets. Do you think there's going to be a sweet spot in the size of the company, being a mid-sized company maybe, or not just quite a small player, but maybe a mid-sized player just so you can have enough capital to make those transitions, but be small enough to be agile enough in the market? Yeah, mid-sized mid to large fleets actually look pretty good in this situation. 
situation. Some of these large scale companies, they almost can't really get hurt too bad because they have such huge presences uh, in the space, but mid to large. Uh, but again, that midsize exposure is still nothing to, uh, to sniff at, especially if you built your infrastructure off of an overheated environment. Awesome, Zach. Well, appreciate your time this morning. I'm sure we'll catch up again on Freightonomics in not, not too distant future. <laughs> right now, we're going to toss it over to Isaiah Buchanan for our social roundabout. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan. I was really glad that Zach Strickland was able to come in this morning and just bless us with his presence and his knowledge. It's such a great way to start the morning. Um, but first, getting into things on with social media, I want to give an update on DeMar Hamlin yesterday. Christian brought up that DeMar Hamlin had been injured during the football game against the Bengals Monday night. Um, so he is still sedated and on a ventilator, but his uncle is saying that he's doing better. That's, that was reported by Fox News early this morning. So we are happy to say that he is hopefully trending a little bit better. That's what his, uh, his uncle is saying. So we'll continue to keep you updated on that situation as we learn more. Now switching things up a little bit. Today's National Trivia Day. So I have a set of trivia questions I'm going to ask each hit. I'm going to start with this one. What was the first toy to be advertised on TV? Now I want you to think about that and I'm going to let you know what that answer is coming up at the end of the hit. And now going, switching things up again, check out this story that happened on Twitter. This is uh, from Scott Stallings. He is a professional golfer. He said that he had been waiting and checking the mailbox five times a day waiting for his invitation to the Masters. And he gets this message on Twitter. It's a DM from another man named Scott Stallings that says, hi, Scott, my name is Scott Stallings as well, and I'm from Georgia. My wife's name is Jennifer, too. Her IG is it's marked out there. We have a condo at blank, and I received a FedEx today from the Masters inviting me to play in the Masters tournament April 6th through the 9th, 2023. I'm 100% sure this is not for me. I play, but wow, nowhere near your level. It's a very nice package complete with everything needed to attend. I think we have some confusion because our names, our wife's names, and our geographical, lo geographical location. I can be reached at blank, and I am more than happy to send this package. And then he even shows another picture of the package. He's like, look, I'm really not kidding, I promise. So pretty funny story that the Masters accidentally sent the wrong Scott Stallings a invitation to the Masters. If I was that other Scott, I would have just shown up and been like, hey, I got my invitation. I'm here to swing a few. I'm here to play a couple rounds. So he's a better man than I am. Um, another thing that I wanted to show you guys this morning is the automated McDonald's that's out in Fort Worth. So this is a test location and we have this video right here and it kind of just walks you through the process of what's going to be happening. So they, you can order everything through kiosks and apps and then they have conveyor belts that will bring you your food. Now a lot of people are kind of worried about this. Some are worried about losing, um, you know, giving away jobs to robots and potentially what's going to happen if you, they get your order wrong. Who do you talk to to get your food right? So there are a lot of concerns coming out of this store, but I, I thought that was really cool now this is out in Fort Worth Texas it's just the only this is the only test location that they have um, so you know McDonald's always seems to have trouble with their ice cream machine so maybe the robots could have a better look with that I'm not sure but we'll see if that continues to be something that they try to work towards um, now back to the trivia question. I asked, what was the first toy to be advertised on TV? And it comes from Toy Story, Mr. Potato Head. Yes, he was the very first toy to be featured in TV advertising. That's all I have for this edition of the Social Roundabout, but stay with us. We're going to have more Freight Waves now coming up after the break.
event like F3, we know what they want is a chance to show off their products, their swag, and make new partnerships that will last until our next Freight Waves event. But the problem is, there are so many industry events, it can be so hard to find the right one to invest your time and energy in. We at Freight Waves take your investment seriously. Which is why we brought together thousands of industry professionals in one city over three days to showcase all you have to offer. Because your successful connections at an event like F3 move all of us forward. Don't believe us? Join, Join us in June. June. This is Thomas Watson, enterprise trucking carrier expert here at Freight Waves, telling you about my show, Loaded and Rolling. Now, it involves trucking topics for large carriers and even small ones that wish to be large. Anything that impacts trucking, you can get it there. You can catch us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern on tv.freightwaves.com. We do it live. Welcome back to Freight Waves Now on this Wednesday morning. Anthony, rumor has that we've got a new show launching today. Wait, today? Today, and we've got Alan Adler. Of course, you know him as our Detroit Bureau Chief. You know him as the writer of the Truck Tech Newsletter, the beat on all things autonomy, Trevor Milton, and really everything in that space. But Alan, we've got a brand new show launching today. Talk to us a little bit about the new offering. I am excited, and I'm excited because I love Easter eggs, and you guys just dropped one in that commercial where you had the new logo for uh, for Truck Tech, which is, it's this has been a while in the making, and uh, we really hope what we can do here is extend the platform, if you will, from Friday's Truck Tech, which has a nice subscriber base now, a little over 11,000, and we hope that those folks and many others will come around and uh, and join us at four o'clock on Friday, uh, excuse me, on Wednesdays, starting today. Um, we'll do this show live as much as we can. Sometimes we're going to need to tape it because of, you know, uh, compelling or conflicting things going on. Sometimes our, our guests won't be able to do it. Sometimes it'll be me. But I got to tell you, uh, today we're starting out with a big one. We've got John O'Leary, who's the CEO of Diamond Truck North America. Um, terrific opportunity. Uh, John is seen usually in bigger settings, so getting him in a one-on-one -on -one is a, a, a real get for Freight Waves. Uh, we're thrilled that they're willing to come along and do that. This is going to be super exciting, and I can't wait for this to happen. Alan, of course, I think you have one of the coolest newsletters out there. When you're looking at this newsletter and the show putting being put together, is this going to play off of each other? Or are these going to be two different separate releases that have really kind of nothing really to do with each other but just going to be under the same umbrella no i think anthony the goal and it's going to take some development to do this but even this week you'll, you'll see some things that carry over um we'll, we'll start the show uh, each week with a few headlines uh, i know some of the other shows do this do similar things and uh in some cases we'll build that out in the friday newsletter which follows the wednesday show that'll happen this week you'll see that in a couple of cases um where i might even make a reference and i will make a reference that you know for a little bit more on this one of our favorite topics of course being nicola because they keep generating news whether they want to or not and uh you know so we will uh, you know mention them today and expound a little bit more on that on friday um so yes there will be a carryover i don't know that it'll always be a pitch forward it may go backwards in time for example after john o'leary our next guest will be rebecca brewster from uh from the american transportation research institute and actually uh, in december put out a study that i think shook up a lot of people about just how much power we talked about it in this, uh, on this show, just how much power it's gonna take to, to, to run electric trucks in this country. Thought that was a subject worth returning to and actually talking to Rebecca about that. She's graciously agreed to join us uh, for our second show on the 11th. And, um, uh, you know, so we'll get into that a little bit more, maybe look at some of the charts that went with that. And so we'll have an opportunity, Anthony, to to sort of dig deeper into some of these topics that, you know, just writing about them and throwing a chart and a story on the website or in the newsletter doesn't get done. 
I love that, and I think that it's a really big opportunity, especially because the space that you cover is so ripe for development, and it's so detailed that oftentimes you need more than just that little blurb in the newsletter, right, to get into it. And of course, me and Anthony can kind of dig into it with you yourself, but it's it's really powerful to hear from the voices who are inspiring that change. I know some of my favorite people that we've talked about and that are really in your wheelhouse include Alex Rodriguez from Embark Trucks, some of the folks over at Plus, and the folks over who are doing those automation things any plans to get them on or who are, who are some of your like kind of dream guests? Well, we kind of have January mapped out. Okay. So the third show is going to be a, a prediction show. We'll have Sam Alpusamid who has been on, on, on the show uh, with us uh, most recently when we had Sam uh, Abbott I from Embark. Uh, I think uh, Sam Alpusamid came on. I believe that's when we did it. Um, he's also been a guest at some of our summits. He's with uh, Guidehouse Insights. And uh, also we're going to invite, uh, I guess maybe he'll hear it for the first time here if he's watching. Um, we're going to invite Antti Lindstrom from S&P Global and we'll do a prediction show on the 18th of the month and then on the 25th you mentioned Alex Rodriguez he is tentatively joining us that day um, and Bark has been making some news of course with the recent story um, of handing off their technology to Knight Swift in in a uh, in a tractor that, that Knight Swift is now operating with its own drivers or will be operating with its own drivers so we're going to continue to use these two to balance off each other I think uh, Kaylee as, as much as we can or uh, play off each other if you will um, some weeks it'll be more apparent others that won't. But we think that having two platforms for truck tech is just a, a great opportunity to do a better job of informing and, and maybe educating a little bit. Certainly, and, and I think so as well, Alan. So of course, throughout 2022, there was just so much activity happening within the space that you're watching. When you were looking at 2022 as a whole, do you see an overall theme for the industry? And do you see anything kind of making a shift or a new theme going into 2023 that you're kind of kind of mold your show around? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think we'll be able to mold the show uh, that precisely. I think we're going to see a continuation and probably some acceleration in some areas. I think we're going to start to see, uh, you know, some sad stories, if you will, of, of companies. We saw a few of these in 2022 with Electric Last Mile, uh, you know, going bankrupt with Romeo being Romeo Power being taken over by Nikola. Um, we saw a merger in the LiDAR space. I think you're going to see more of that. I think that's a continuing trend, especially as the economy continues continues to batter some of these companies that are really short on cash and, and don't have an opportunity, uh, you know, to really go into the market and get more money right now. So I think consolidation is going to be a theme this year. Um, I don't know that it'll play out monthly or anything, but I think you're going to see more of it. And most of the people we talked to at the end of the year for our autonomy roundup that ran on freight waves, uh, you know, really touched on that because, well, one, because I asked the question of every one of them is, you know, do you see a consolidation? And every one of them, uh, even those that might get consolidated, validated said yes. It's going to be interesting to watch for sure. Alan, do we get Trevor Milton on the show at any point in time? What do, what do we think? <laughs> <laughs> My guess is no, but um, it doesn't mean we couldn't ask, um, you know, if there's some B-roll of him. You know, the 27th of January is his current uh, uh, sentencing date. Um, my guess is that appeals will keep him out free on, on the $100 million uh, uh, bail that he's out on now. So I don't think he's going to be behind bars. I do expect, though, that he'll get a sentence that will uh, push that direction. Um not making predictions here. But I would I would say that Trevor will continue to be probably less of a story for us. I think Nicola will continue to be a big story. Um, you know, even this Friday's newsletter, just to, to tip that off a little bit, they've, they've made some moves now that really begin to call into question just how viable they are, how long is their runway. Um, mm -hmm. They've got some serious uh, expenses ahead. Uh, they're raising money. The stock price is depressed, and I mean really depressed. So, you know, th this is one that's going to bear watching. And in fact, I even asked the question in the beginning of the, of the item for this Friday. I said, you know, why do we talk about these guys so much? Well, we do because it's compelling what's happening with this company. And Alan, real quick for those watching right now, just maybe tuning in, what time and when can they catch your show? Yes. Um, so, so Truck Tech uh, on air, if you will, is going to be at four o'clock on Wednesdays Eastern Time. We uh, we invite you to uh, you know bookmark it. I think you can bookmark these off of our homepage, um, and also for the newsletter itself, um, that is uh, https 
to a colon two slashes <laughs> freightwaves.com backslash truck hyphen tech and if you can remember all that you're better than i am but uh anyway so so we'll uh, hopefully put that on screen for people because we do want we do want to see the interplay not just between the newsletter and the tv show but we want to see the viewers and the readers um getting the opportunity without feeling like oh well, i already know all this you know we're going to try really hard not to uh you know to to do repeaters and and we won't because we've got a 20 minute guest spot each week and then, you know, just a handful of headlines. So hopefully the the folks that we're able to attract and bring on, and I know we've got some some big guests that we've made requests of, some, some CEO level, C-suite people. Uh, we're going to try to continue or to, to get off to a great start and continue to bring the industry leaders um, in to uh, have these conversations. And of course, you can follow us on the FreightWaves.com app. You can head on over to tv.freightwaves.com and get these episodes on demand. They'll be airing on LinkedIn. They'll be up on YouTube. So endless places to get this content. Alan, thank you for joining us. We will catch the premiere of your show this afternoon. Okay. And you're supposed to say what? Break a leg or something? Isn't that what? Is that? I, I, think, I think that's theater. TV is totally different. <laughs> Got it. And there's no theater to what we do, right? None. No, absolutely not. <laughs> All right, Alan, thank you so much. We'll see you this afternoon. Right now, we're going to head back on over to the wall for our next carrier update. Welcome into this carrier update, Donnie. Going to start here looking at the reefer rejection, outbound tender rejection index. And we talked about volumes comparing them to 2019, 2020. Big difference here when we look at rejections. And we're going to have a to lot of effects. I've got some nervous. Like I kind of talked about it yesterday, but we'll go into a little bit more today as well with reefer. So here we are with rejection rates far below uh, the last three years, four years. Uh, this is probably historic lows for this time of the year. Mm -hmm. We've never been in that five, six, seven percent range for rejection rates for reefer. <clears throat> now, there's, we, we talked yesterday, there's a couple different things affecting reefer uh, or affecting rejection rates than there are uh, volumes or tender lead mm -hmm. times. And that is, we have, number one, we're heading into an, a, a rough time where all these large carriers are just going to auto accept, which we know that brings it down. Yep. <clears throat> but we also have fueling issues, and that is, Fuel was at 474. We'll, we'll look at it here today, see where it's at today. <clears throat> but we have a very, very high fuel um, average rate across the US, mm -hmm. which is pushing truckers to fall back to their contracted freight only because they want that fuel surcharge, yep. which is 75 to 80 cents per mile. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, both of those factors, my concern is what if spot rates start to rise? Are we going to see that normal increase in rejection rate or the rejection rate start to increase, spot rates start to rise? We may not see that. Yeah. So something else I've been looking at is tender lead times, mm -hmm. which we'll also get into. So as we see this, these may stay very low, even though spot rates maybe start to turn up at first. We may not see it in rejection rates right off, right off the bat yep. because it needs to clear a certain point before it's going to be advantageous for them to give up that fuel surcharge. Yeah. Unless fuel prices drop back to $3 a gallon. And that's not happening. That might take a while. Yeah. And we'll look at that as well because we did see a slight uptick in fuel today. Mm -hmm. So pay attention to what's going on with your rejection rates, but expect them to stay in this 4 to 7% range for quite some time. Yep. <clears throat> now let's go on to the uh, next chart here. Uh, this is what I get into tender, tender lead times. Uh, here, this is back before December, so this is Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And this right here is Christmas and New Year's. Uh, so this explains to us and shows us when shippers are under pressure. When they're under pressure, they're going to be willing to pay more. And this is uh, from the shipper's perspective. So carriers can watch this. And this might be a good idea to use. You can break this down per market to use this and decide when and where to adjust their rates. <clears throat> Let's go to the next chart here. See if I have broke out here by uh, market here. Mm -hmm. Now I got your tender lead time, which is the, the, the shades of blue. And then of course I've got your volumes uh, in the, the shaded area coming, the, the 3D model, the shaded area coming up. So we look at this and we see a few out there, Twin Falls, very dark, it's got very high tender lead times. We're looking at around the 7.5 per day versus a 4.4 average. Mm -hmm. uh, we see Atlanta, a little bit darker blue. Joliet, a little bit darker blue. Now some of these up here in the, in the Midwest, they're very dark, but there's very low volume. So maybe be careful. If you can find Roofer Freight coming out of North 
North Dakota, it might be very advantageous, but you might want to go there on a, on a contracted rate, which is going to pay you very well to go to North Dakota, yep. and then get your freight coming back out by spot to get you back home. You could do very well running those areas that nobody wants to run, mm -hmm. but pay attention to Miss Kaylee and her weather reports because this area up here has gotten a lot of snow. You don't want to get into South Dakota and get stuck in four foot of snow like we saw, yep. and then not be able to run for four days, and then you actually end up losing a lot of money. Yeah, it's that opportunity cost, right? Yes. That's, that doesn't actually show up on the bottom line or the top line, but it does factor in overall. Instead of $2,000 revenue in four days, it's $2,000 revenue in eight days, mm -hmm. and that's what really hurts. So pay attention to your, your tender lead times on reefer and drive in, and you might find some uh, better information to help you know when markets are turning. Absolutely. Well, Donnie, thank you so much for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you again a little later. Right now, we'll take a look at the last 24 hours in freight with the market update. Welcome back to another edition of Check Call. Check Call. Check Call. Check Call. Let's go. Nobody works for free, so why should we be expecting our drivers to? Okay, let's just get it together now. What are some of those proactive steps that you can start taking um, now for myself? I would like the earth to still be here for a little bit longer, but, right. you know. <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> oh, okay. Is pizza an open face sandwich? It's bread. I have been ready for this question. <laughs> I've seen the show. We're all in this together. Thanks for making me hungry. Now I want a hot dog. <laughs> You're welcome. Catch episodes of Check Call Tuesdays at 12.30 on FreightWaves TV. Keep up with all things Check Call on FreightWaves.com slash Check Call. See you on the internet. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now.
Welcome back to Freight Waves Now. It's time for our next check of the weather here. We're watching our next major storm system set up across the coast of California, bringing heavy rainfall, strong winds, mudslides, sinkholes, basically you name it, the California coast has got it right now. Let's check it out in sonar critical events. We've got the radar up and we've also got up our flash flood warnings and our high wind warnings for the mountains and the coast of California. So everywhere from the California Oregon border all the way down through San Francisco into the Santa Barbara area, just to the north of LA, we do have some pretty intense rainfall moving onshore. Some places in San Francisco and just to the east of the actual city have gotten upwards of four and a half inches of rain so far. And as this atmospheric river continues to push moisture onshore, we can expect another about two and a half to three inches total of rain through the hours today and into tomorrow. Because of that, we do have flood warnings up in place and flash flood watches up in place higher in the mountains. Those also coincide with high wind warnings and those higher elevations. So with this, you're going to have a lot of heavy rain over some ground that is really not saturated because it is so typically dry in California. So heavy rain over not saturated ground turns that into mudslide territory, especially in those mountains. Couple that with high winds could be seeing down trees, down power lines, and really just a pretty messy situation out there. Farther out to the east, once you get into those higher mountains of California, that moisture turns into snow. So we're looking at trouble passing on I-80 through those mountain passes going towards Reno and trouble as well out in the Fresno Valley as well. So overall, California just gonna be kind of a mess here these next few days. Rain continued, expected to continue through at least the evening hours tonight into the beginning of tomorrow. We're gonna to talk a little bit more about what the storm could bring to the central parts of the country later on next week. We'll do that in our next hour here on Freight Waves Now. Right now we're gonna to toss things back over to Isaiah Buchanan. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and I want to start things up following off where Christian Thomas left off yesterday. So he mentioned DeMar Hamlin, the Buffalo Bills safety, who was injured during their game Monday night, um, and he had to have CPR on the field. So right now, he is still currently on a ventilator, and he is sedated right now. Um, he's not able to breathe by himself, but his family, his uncle did report to Fox News that he is getting better, so hopefully he continues to progress in that way and continue, continue to get better and better as the days go along. Now, switching things up just a little bit, many of you have probably heard the name Scott Stallings before. He is a professional golfer, and the past couple of days, he's been waiting to get his invitation to the Masters, which is coming up April 6th through the 9th, um, here in just a couple of months. But it turns out that his invitation actually got sent to the wrong Scott Stallings, who also has the, the same name as his wife. Take a look at this DM that he got. It says, hi, Scott. My name is Scott Stallings as well, and I'm from Georgia. My wife's name is Jennifer, too. We have a condo, and I received a FedEx today from the Masters inviting me to play in the Masters tournament April 6th through the 9th, 2023. I'm 100% sure this is not for me. I play, but wow. Nowhere near your level. It's a very nice package complete with everything you need to attend. I think we have some confusion because our names, our wife's names, and geographical location. I can be reached and I am more than happy to send this package to you. They also, he also followed up that DM with a picture of the package and that picture, uh, it says, trust me, I'm being honest, I promise, I'm being for real, I promise. So, you know, that, he's just going to show that, hey, I actually got this package, so I think that's really funny. And the Scott Stallings, who's not the professional golfer, is a better man than me because I definitely would have taken my opportunity to show up to the matches and play a couple holes. Now. Today is actually National Trivia Day, and I have a trivia question for Anthony and Kaylee. And the question is, which country invented ice cream? Do you, either, either one of you have a guess at which country created the best dessert that is out there? I'm gonna go with Iceland. <laughs> Iceland for ice cream, I don't know. That would be a good guess, but actually, it was China. Hmm. Who would have thought that China came up with ice cream? I had no idea. I feel like that's something that we would have made here in America. You know, it's super fattening and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, hey, China came up with, that's probably the one good thing that China's done for us. I do love me some ice cream. Anthony, do you have a favorite flavor or do you even like ice cream? Vanilla bean. But I am okay. kind of, it's kind of intriguing that you go to a Chinese restaurant and the ice cream is authentically Chinese, oh. but the fortune cookie isn't. It's an American, I think, adaptation. You know what? I learn something new every single day. 
I gotta say though, the best flavor of ice cream is coffee. Does that actually have like coffee in it? So can you get caffeinated from the coffee ice cream? I don't think so, but I love coffee ice cream. Okay, okay. So I can get behind. I like the way coffee smells. Yeah. I get behind that. But so there you go. We have tons more fruit is now coming up, and also tons more content coming up mm -hmm. throughout the month. We have our first virtual event of the year coming up shortly. Absolutely, the Sales and Marketing Summit will be here in just about a week and a day. Next Thursday, January 12th, you can head on over to live.freightwaves.com and get registered for that. And while you're there, you might as well plan out the rest of your year for our events. Handful of virtuals, two in-persons. We want to see you at every single one of them. Networking opportunities abound. You don't want to miss it. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break. We'll be right back with our second hour of Freight Waves now in just a few minutes. When guests come to an event like F3, we know what they want is a chance to show off their products, their swag, and make new partnerships that will last until our next Freight Waves event. But the problem is, there are so many industry events, it can be so hard to find the right one to invest your time and energy in. We at Freight Waves take your investment seriously. Which is why we've brought together thousands of industry professionals in one city over three days to showcase all you have to offer. Because your successful connections at an event like F3 move all of us forward. Don't believe us? Join, Join us in June. Welcome back for our second hour of Freight Waves now on this Wednesday morning, starting off things with a look at your 10 a.m. top stories. The benchmark diesel price moved up yesterday following seven straight weeks of declines as retail prices finally started reacting to higher futures and wholesale numbers. However, just as the pump price moved up, diesel futures posted one of the biggest declines since July. The weekly DOE price came in at $4.58, up 4.6 cents. This is still about 80 cents less than the highest price seen back in October of this year. The upward tick follows an increase in the price of ultra-low sulfur diesel on the CME Commodity Exchange of more than 57 cents per gallon during the last month of 2022. The Surface Transportation Board has ordered Union Pacific to fix its service issues raised by customer Foster Poultry Farms in California. Foster Farms filed a petition for emergency service before the board last week, noting continued service declines and the STB response calls for UP to deliver specific train sets of animal feed to Foster Farms on a time schedule specified by the railroad. The schedule will help prevent a significant loss of livestock in California, according to the Surface Transportation Board. The European Union ban on Russian seaborne crude imports has been in effect for about a month, but the expected hike to crude tanker rates has not happened yet. Crude tanker rates are actually down double digits since the restrictions went into place, although they remain highly profitable. Clarkson Securities reported yesterday that spot rates for eco-designed very large crude carriers were $45,600 per day, down 28% month over month. Spot rates for Suez Maxes were $57,800 per day, down 28.6% month over month. 
Septin, one of the few publicly traded LiDAR companies in the United States, unveiled its newest offering yesterday for real-time adaptive 3D imaging. The sensors are well-suited for use in cars and vans and will be helpful in autonomous vehicle deployment. The system is so small in size that it can be placed in the vehicle during the manufacturing phase or after manufacturing without affecting the appearance of the vehicle. The system will also process data at the fastest rate of Septin's current LiDAR systems with a view field that is up to 30 degrees wider than current operations operations. And the December Logistics Managers Index showed the sharpest rate of contraction for transportation pricing ever during these last months. The LMI came in at 36.9 for the month, with the rate of decline the fastest in the six-year history of the index. Transportation utilization fell into contraction for the first time since April of 2020, with a reading of 48.1, while capacity expanded with a reading of 69.5. The report cited full warehouses before the holiday season as one of the reasons for the contraction, saying that less transportation was needed to move goods last minute. And you can find details of these stories and much more up on FreightWaves.com and our FreightWaves app. And if you're watching us live, give us a like and subscribe to stay updated. For the full FreightWaves TV experience, head on over to TV.FreightWaves.com. We're going to toss things back over to the wall. We've got our next carrier update. Welcome into this carrier update. Donnie, get to start here looking at lead times up in, I mean, starting here, first one, Green Bay, comparing it to the yeah, so national average. Continue talking about tender lead times. We looked at the map here, and I saw Green Bay was dark blue. Mm -hmm. So the way I compare this is, is I bring up the, the, the national, which we see here in blue. Today it's 4.38. And I'll compare markets. I'll compare this to the national, see if they're above, below, how they're reacting to the national. And I see Green Bay is, is well above. So this might be a market that would interest me that might have better spot rates than what's going on in the rest of the world mm -hmm. here in the U.S., the rest of the world in the U.S. So let's go to the next chart here real quick and just kind of double check that with our market dashboard. And you'll see just a simple lane here. Uh, Green Bay to Kansas City, turn my reefer on, make sure it's on. And I saw um, here in blue, I put my uh, <clears throat> ROTLT here for Green Bay up here and you see that it reacts and then you see spot rates pull up. Mm -hmm. So again, just to kind of proof it and let people know, hey, check out reefer tender lead times, drive in tender lead times, because this might be where you find the effects and really be able to see what markets are actually starting to move here since rejection rates are being pushed down by both uh, all the carriers accepting and the, those high fuel prices that we've experienced over the last several months. Absolutely. So good example. All right, let's change gears here and go to the next chart. Uh, our freight waves NTI here dropped again, Tony, uh, about 11 cents here down to 270. We expect this rapid drop, drop here to, the, to continue. You'll see the seven day rolling average. It's gonna take a little bit of time, but it's gonna drop here pretty rapidly towards the end of the week or maybe early next week yep. because of these rapid changes right here. Yeah, once you start getting rid of those 297 a mile, uh, those fall off that seven day average and you factor in the 270s, it it's it, going to drop. It and drops we'll, pretty quick. I'm expecting that we'll get back down here to this 250, 260 range yeah. probably by the middle of next week, if yeah. not by the end of this week. Yeah, because I mean, by, when you look at it, right, that in between period from Thanksgiving to Christmas, we were in that range. Prior to Thanksgiving, we were in that range. So it's like everything, which isn't a surprise when you think about how the holidays affect spot rates, but it just kind of shows that, hey, that's probably where we're headed back to. And, and quick honestly, quick. we could be headed. Lower. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean this is the bottom or was the bottom. Yeah. We could be headed even it, lower. It's tough to get to go up. It's real easy to get to go down. Yep. So now that we're past the holidays, I think we're going to see this drop rapidly. Mm -hmm. I think, I believe Christmas and New Year's was holding this up mm -hmm. a little bit. So I believe we're probably going to go just a little bit further on down uh, as we go through January and February. Yep. <clears throat> real fast, one more chart here. Uh, diesel fuel prices here popped up just less than one cent, but this increase that we talked about yesterday, yes. it's starting to affect uh, our fuel prices here. I'm gonna go fill up today, Tony, because I have a feeling by the end of the week, we're gonna be 10 or 15 cents more expensive here in Chattanooga. Absolutely, well, Donnie, thank you so much for the update. We'll be sure to check in with you one more time before the end of the day. Right now, we'll hand it over to Kaylee and Anthony. All right, guys, thank you for that. We're going to welcome in our next live guest. We've got Blythe Brumley, owner of Digital Dispatch, and our social media expert joining us today. Blythe, thank you for being here. We're going to talk about some of your expected trends for freight marketing in 2023. Let's dig right into them. 
first, yeah, let, let's just get right into it. So I, I have a podcast coming out tomorrow that covers three big things. But what I think is really sort of central around the predictions for freight marketing is really what's happening in the greater marketing ecosphere. And that's, we've talked a lot on this show with FreightWaves Now, with AI coming into the mix over the last year and all of the different advancements. And, you know, some of them are really good. And then some of them are kind of scary as to how this is going to make marketing evolve. And then, so one of those predictions is obviously AI is just going to dominate when it comes to marketing, especially when it comes to those mundane tasks, um, low quality blog articles, things like that. And then the other side of it is really about content remixing, the importance of content remixing and taking long form content, turning it into short form content, and then distributing it out to these different social media platforms in the way that it makes sense for those platforms. It's really about doing more with less, which sounds kind of impossible because it's already kind of the, the main job responsibility for marketers out there is doing more with less. But you're going to have to focus on with because of these AI tools coming into the play or coming into the mix, then you're really going to have to focus on that quality over quantity, which is what I think a lot of marketers have been focusing on, but you're going to have to up your game a lot in the coming years. And Blythe, really with being able to embrace that AI, do you think really with these early stages that we're seeing right now, of course, it's growing and improving and it's getting better and better month after month. Um, but do you think we'll initially be able to discern, OK, this is something that's been generated by AI versus something that's been put together by someone, you know, an actual person? It's really difficult to tell because there was uh, one person that I follow on Twitter that actually took his writings, what he really wrote in a document and uploaded it to one of these scanners. And it said that it was 67% written by AI. And he said, this is false. I wrote this all myself. So it's not technically sure about what is AI and what isn't AI. And the problem with that is that it, it falls back to the language model that's being created. ChatGPT is one of those language models models that's been created and it, it's trained by humans and robots at the same time. So it's very difficult for these different software technologies to detect if it's written by AI because as some, you know, anecdotal tests that, you know, somebody posts about on Twitter, it's not exactly up to par yet. And I fear it's one of those situations where the AI is just going to keep getting better and these other tools are just going to continue to play catch up. So the whole more with less mentality is something that you mentioned marketers have had to deal with forever, right? We know that marketing doesn't get a huge piece of a company's budget, but especially now as we see a tighter economic, um, kind of an economic climate, we know that marketing budgets are one of those ones that gets tightened down first, right? It gets clamped down. A lot of these opportunities you have aren't free marketing, social media, anything that's like a word of mouth thing. How much more are companies or marketers going to have to start to rely on those free aspects as their budgets get tighter and tighter? They 100% have to rely on, on these free tactics. And, and that's arguably where I would spend most of my time before I would ever engage in paid advertisements or things like that. Because from an organic perspective, you need to have that feedback loop. You need to be able to have those comments, those engagements, those, those questions that people ask whenever you do post something. And you need to be able to answer those with future, com or with future content. And so you're going to have to continuously reiterate, but you don't know what that feedback process or that feedback loop loop looks like until you start actively publishing. And I think for a lot of marketers, they're, they're trying to do more with less. They're trying to, they're, they're strapped for time because a lot of these platforms, it's not necessarily the money aspect. It's the time aspect. It's the creating the content that you want to actually put on social media. It's coming up with the verbiage that you're going to post to that particular social media account. It's checking in periodically to see if there's any comments and see if, you know, it's trending in the right direction with the types of job titles that, you know, or the types of people that are like the post, meaning your, your job title. Is it senior executives? Is it, you know, someone at a lower level or, you know, in the trenches employees? So who are you trying to target? And are those people interacting with your post? And you have to constantly be in those trenches too, to understand what's going to work well from an organic perspective, because if it works well organically, then that gives you much more insight and much more runway to request a budget, to put a budget advertising on social media and, and boosting those posts because it's done well already organically. And Blythe, the other thing that you mentioned, of course, was content remixing. What is the premise of this and what does this really entail? 
It's really about the whole premises of doing more with less. So how do you start off with long form content and then be able to switch that into content that's great for email, content that's great for social media uh, and, and in those different environments, right? So Twitter is great for text-based posts, sometimes images, you know, they're, they're really trying to push video. Well, with YouTube, obviously, you know that, you know, text-based posts aren't necessarily going to be the thing that are that's going to win for you. They do have that capability on YouTube as well, but it's going to be the videos, it's going to be shorts. And so focusing on the where the content is going to end up before you start making the content is really what content remixing is all about. Start with video first, because then you can take the audio from that video and upload it to a podcast. Then you can take that content and condense it down even more so that you can really just get mass distribution for that content that you spent a lot of time creating. And that a lot of, you know, maybe depending on your, your publishing schedule or how you're creating that long form content, the people that are included in those conversations. So from interviews, subject matter experts within your company, leaders, leaders within your company, giving those the tools, giving them the tools that they need. So those video files, those video assets that they can then promote on their own personal social media channels. There's a whole distribution process of remixing that original one piece of content that was maybe 30 to 45 minutes long in a video, but that turns into so many other things when you remix it and when you think about uploading it directly to that platform of choice. What are the nuances of that platform? What is the language that's, you know, the, the moniker that are used within that platform, knowing all of those things, doing more with less, focusing on a couple different social media channels at a time and remixing the content that you've already put a lot of time into is really how you're going to win that quality over quantity game. Well, I have the last question for you. When it comes to content mixing like that, how much of the onus should be on you as the interviewer, as the original source of the content, handing over that original content to maybe your guests? So I'm thinking like, okay, right, you come on the podcast, I take the clip of the podcast and give it to you directly to distribute to your audience versus me asking you, hey, share the link to this to my content. Is there, one, is there a better side to one or the other or is it just getting eyes in front of that content in general? So I, I think it's both. I think you have to obviously credit whatever source or whatever platform that you were on first. But if you try to take a link and post it up to LinkedIn and try to send traffic there, that post is automatically going to get downgraded in LinkedIn's algorithm. So you want to set that person up for success by giving them those clips and giving them those video file assets. So the direct MP4 file or MP3 file, um, graphics packages, things like that, putting those together to make it easy for them to share. And and then once you send that to them, then just say, please credit, you know, this podcast and what they can do is they can credit it in the comments or they can credit it in, you know, in, in some other way without sending traffic away from that social media platform, because then you're, you're getting what the social media platform wants. The user is getting those articles or getting that content that they can share to their own audience. And then it also is sharing awareness around your content of, of what you originally invited that guest on to do. Another thing that I've seen that's worked extremely well is just as a company, as a host, you know, regularly promoting that person and tagging them in it and making it really, really easy for them to share it and repost it. Because for a lot of times, you know, a lot of creators were inundated with all of the content that we have to share. And so making it as easy as possible for us to log in, see a notification and they say, oh, I was tagged in this. Oh, real quick, I'm going to repost it. I'm going to reshare it. And it makes it super easy for them to be able to share that content that you've already spent time creating. So there's kind of two ways to tackle it from what I see it. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Before we let you go real quick, when can people catch your next podcast? Next podcast, everything is logistics.com or re releases tomorrow. It's the first one of the new format. So I'm super excited to, to, to get it rolling out finally. Awesome. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Looking forward to that episode. Right now, we're going to head over to Kaylee Nix, who has our next weather update. Anthony, thank you for that. Taking a look up into the upper Great Lakes and the middle parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, is we've got the cold side of the storm system impacting the lower U.S. right now, bringing some, once again, heavy snowfall up there. Some blizzard conditions in place as well along that I-90 corridor in southwestern Minnesota. So again, terrible driving conditions out there today. Let's check it out in sonar critical events. We've got a ton of snowfall happening across really all of Minnesota, right, right, right along the Minnesota-Wisconsin border, but wrapping down into 
to that southwestern corner, adding for some travel issues along I-90. We've got a little bit of snow lingering as well into South Dakota and down into Iowa, but not nearly as bad as the central parts of Minnesota right now. So the Minneapolis-St. Paul area really just having a terrible time with all of this snow. Some places getting up to a foot of snow today because of its slow moving and it's really pretty heavy as well. Heavy snow and accumulating ice expected to hit this area from the rest of the evening tonight into tomorrow. We've got some more onshore flow and moisture coming off of Lake Michigan into the Wisconsin, the Milwaukee area and into Green Bay as well. So basically the entire area from um, Lake Michigan westward going to be dealing with issues today. We do also have winter weather advisories in place along the eastern parts of Iowa, closer into Chicago as well. That I-80 corridor through the eastern half of Iowa going to be seeing some problems with possible icing as well as heavy accumulating snow again in some of those areas. Temperatures behind this going to drop down pretty substantially as we see the uh, cold air continue to move in. And then right up behind it, that storm that's moving on the coast of California will set up and bring once again more moisture and that cold wintry weather across the central parts of the plains and then once again back up into the Great Lakes area. So really can't get a break up there for those folks in the cold and it's just going to continue as we move throughout the rest of the week this week. We'll talk about weather one more time before we're done here for the day. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. Once again, 10 questions for an unsuspecting individual. They have to answer them all. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest. It is none other than Thomas Watson, loaded and rolling host. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Bill. I am ready and not prepared for what's about to be asked. <laughs> awesome. Because <laughs> I'm going to throw 10 questions at you. I need 10 answers. You ready? Let's go. All right. Number one, normally I would ask, what is the number one problem your company or organization is trying to solve? But because we've done a few FreightWaves personalities, I'm switching that to what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given in the freight industry? Fake it till you make it. <laughs> and why? <laughs> because oftentimes they're not gonna train you for what you need to do and you're only gonna find out by messing it up. So trying to have a brave face as you're navigating through the chaos is super important to instill confidence. All right then, number two, what's the best book you've ever read that has helped you in the industry? 
Uh, this one, I would say Truckload Transportation by Leah Lazarus. But that's a very technical one. My personal favorite is How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Big by uh, Scott Adams, creator of Dilbert. Very good. All right. You're in a cross-country hall, and you have only one artist that you can listen to for your 1,000-mile trip. Who are you picking? Country artist? Of, of any genre. Oh, oh, man. Uh, including uh, synth wave. Including synth wave. Uh, I'm going to have to go with, oh, that's a really, really tough one. Let's go with Led Zeppelin. It's got a little bit of everything. All right. Excellent there. Uh, number four, uh, you get a chance to have dinner with anyone in freight, living or dead. Who do you, have, who do you want to have dinner with? The person who invented the wheel. I need to find out who they are, but they started this whole revolution. You can turn it into a cart or even a truck. We just got to figure out who they are and where they are. And then you take them out to dinner, I'm sure that it'd be much better than what they're used to. <laughs> Great, well put. Number five, uh, this is a tough one, so you can take a minute to think if you'd like. Who is on your Mount Rushmore of freight? Ooh, that that would be really cool. I would say um, General Sherman. He did his march to the sea in Atlanta, but in order to do so, he needed a lot of logistics. And I think that would be really, really interesting because the American Civil War did provide uh, a great example for future wars on how to do logistics and intermodal in addition to the fact that some primary sources mentioned that even troops were willing to rebel if they didn't get their coffee delivered. Wow, anybody else on that uh, list of four? Uh, I would also say that uh, uh, the folks who, whoever came up with uh, the Red Ball Express in World War II, I don't know if that was Omar Bradley or Eisenhower, but uh, the fact that they managed to do nonstop resupply, that would be pretty, pretty legit to, to learn about. All right, I'll leave you with those two then as well. Uh, number six, you've had some great, as we call them, wassonisms on television. What's your favorite line you've ever said on TV? Oh, gosh. Um, there's never a favorite one. They all are just very spontaneous. Uh, so I would, I would have to say the one that I haven't come up with yet, it's going to be my favorite. All right, that's a good answer. Um, number seven, what's the best meal you've ever had when on the road? In other words, you're going through a town or maybe you're just stopping for a day. You go to a place, the meal blows you away. Where were you and what did you have? I would have to say the best meal quite literally on the side of the road was when I was in Germany and it was a Döner kebab where they had this giant piece of meat that was just slow roasting and they shaved it off and stuck it together and handed it to you. I was very hungover at the time, but it was by far the best street eats slash walking driving. And it was just on the side, you know, you're just downtown random kebab stand. They were, they were great folks. Sometimes that can be the best, the best medicine at all times. Uh, number eight, the greatest unsolved problem in freight right now is? Right now it's basically uh, how to be more efficient while also still making money. Uh, because right now a big problem with trucking is utilization and uh, the factors are you're always competing against the supply chain. So you can drive your trucks very efficiently, but it's always the place you're picking up or delivering that keeps slowing you down. So that's the biggest problem in freight is how do we just speed it up? Okay, number nine, name something you think will be mainstream in 10 years that is not mainstream now. Oh man, I'm gonna say, uh, for trucking in particular, I wanna say exclusive truck stops. You know, everyone complains that truck stops are, you know, lacking or disgusting. I'm waiting for someone to have like the VIP truck stop where you have to be like a paid member to come to this cool truck stop. And then everyone's gonna wanna come to the cool truck stop. Excellent, all right, and last one. Complete this sentence, freight is blank. The illusion of control. <laughs> Freight uh, chaos. Thomas Watson, you are off the hot seat. Everybody, this is Thomas Watson, Enterprise Trucking Carry Expert here at Freight Waves, telling you about my show, Loaded and Rolling. Now, it involves trucking topics for large carriers and even small ones that wish to be large. Anything that impacts trucking, you can get it there. You can catch us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern on tv.freightwaves.com. We do it live. When guests come to an event like F3, we know what they want is a chance to show off their products, their swag, and make new partnerships that will last until
until our next Freight Waves event. But the problem is there are so many industry events, it can be so hard to find the right one to invest your time and energy in. We at Freight Waves take your investment seriously, which is why we brought together thousands of industry professionals in one city over three days to showcase all you have to offer. Because your successful connections at an event like F3 move all of us forward. Don't believe us? Join us in June. Welcome back to Freight Waves Now. It's time for our last look at the weather before we head out of here on your Wednesday. We are kind of slowly watching this rain that's across pretty much the mid-Atlantic down to the southeast, moving up to the north-northeast, which will eventually turn into some heavy snowfall, once again for the upper parts of New York, into Vermont, New Hampshire, and into Maine. So let's check it out in sonar critical events. Right now, we're a little too far away to have any weather warnings in place for these areas. But what's starting out is rain right now across Ohio, down into Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia will eventually start to move up, interact with some cold air that's already in place across New York and Massachusetts into Vermont and New Hampshire, turn that into some heavy snowfall, bringing some more snow to the area, which has already seen a pretty decent amount so far this year. We've got winter weather advisories in place across Massachusetts right now, in excluding the Boston Metro, that is, and then even down into the far northwestern corner of Connecticut, New York still not having any advisories in place, but we can expect this rain to start to hit uh, about the evening hours tonight into the early parts of tomorrow morning, eventually turning into snowfall here by the time that your Thursday turns into Friday for those folks. Overall snowfall accumulation not expected to be anything really substantial, looking at maybe about two and a half to three inches coming out of this. It's really going to depend on if we see more onshore moisture flow come and interact with that cold here in the next few days. But behind that, the snow that's currently spinning just off of the western part of Lake Michigan in through the central parts of Minnesota will eventually move up there as well, bringing a second round of heavy snowfall to end out your week. That does it for the weather today. We'll continue to keep a watch on it throughout the rest of your week here on Freight Waves Now. We'll toss things back over to Isaiah for a final look at the social roundabout. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I want to start off my segment kind of following up what Christian talked about yesterday. He talked about Bills, uh, Buffalo Bills safety, DeMar Hamlin, who was injured in their game Monday against the Bengals. So Hamlin um, is still sedated and on a ventilator, but his uncle did report that he is trending upwards right now. So we're hoping that he continues to trend upward over the coming days. Now, switching things up just a little bit, McDonald's has their first automated um, restaurant in the country and it's going to be in Fort Worth, Texas. So if you're out in that area, you can make a stop by there. So everything that's on the menu, you can get everything, you can order everything through either apps or the kiosk and then they have conveyor belts that will deliver the food to you. Now there are some people who are a little worried about this, you know, a lot of people. The big argument is jobs, taking away jobs from people and giving them to robots. Um, a lot of people are worried about that and there's other questions about what happens if they get your order wrong and how they're going to be able to get that fixed if there's not actually anybody there that you can communicate with. But right now, that is the only store that they have. That's their test location in Fort Worth, Texas. So if you're out in that area, make sure you stop by and try it out, see, if what, you, see what you think about it. 
But all, today is also National Trivia Day, and I have one last trivia question I want to ask everybody, and maybe the guys over at the round table can give their best shot at this as well. But I want to ask, what is the smallest country in the world? Does anybody have any guesses they want to throw out at me? Anybody? Anybody? And they have guessed Vatican City, and that would be correct. The fun fact about Vatican City, it's actually less than two-tenths of a square mile. It's actually one of the places that's on my bucket list to visit. So hopefully I get to do that one day. But yes, Vatican City is the smallest country in the world. That's all I have for this edition of the Social Roundabout. Right now I'm going to toss things over to Bill Priestley for our roundtable. Welcome into the roundtable. Bill Priestley here with Zach Strickland, Tony Mulvey, and uh, we're going to go over one of those things that uh, you talked about earlier is, of course, the uh, the interesting uh, ousting of uh, Bob Besterfield at C.H. Robinson, and we're going to talk about the role of the CEO in terms of what they need to be watching in uh, in these down economic times, and especially to kind of hopefully avoid uh, situations that we've seen. And gentlemen, I kind of feel like that we're seeing a lot of trucking companies out there as skiers. And it's avalanche season, and nobody knows exactly what's going on. You you said it earlier, like, we, you don't want this to be a precursor to massive change. But, Tony, let me ask you first, what right now do CEOs need to concentrate on in order to keep themselves as well as their companies afloat? Well, I mean, I think the first, first thing, thing, and probably the most important, is, I mean, I don't want to say growing profitably, or not growing profitably, but staying profitable. Staying afloat is number one. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you're seeing it across the board, and it's not just in freight or just in tech. I mean, you're seeing layoffs happen, and those are ways to get the budget. I mean, it's the fastest way to get the budget in line, is when you think about it, the t labor is the number one cost across the board in basically any industry you're in. It's number one. It's the fastest way to get it in line. And... It sounds bad to say it, but when you head into these downturns, you do have to get, it's, it's a time where you do have to tighten that belt. It's, it's not this grow at all costs, willy nilly. Uh, let's spend money just to continue to try to grab share. You have to be more strategic and more focused on future growth plans and things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. I mean, obviously, there's no, I mean, we've I've been in a company where we had the same cycles every single year. Winter came, uh, volumes <laughs> dropped, and there's just not enough work to sustain the workforce. And that's obviously what's uh, happening here right now is that we all knew that we were in an overheated environment, and you have to be able to manage that, that downturn. Now, uh, I would add on to that that you want to make sure that you're making the strategic decisions, and it's not just a straight, like, a lot of people go in there and go 5% done. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah. That's probably not the right mindset to have in this environment because what we're going to see and what we have seen is rapid changes. So volatility is the thing to now put in your head instead of like, oh, like with us, it was winter came. Well, now it's going to be <laughs> when is December happening? Yep. You know, when is yeah. winter coming again? We just won't know. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned this, of course, with the, the – you felt like maybe perhaps the relationship that Bob had with the board uh, was maybe possibly one of the reasons of, of his leaving. Let's talk a little bit about the CEO relationship to shareholders and boards. Um, obviously, you've got to be aware of the company and what it's doing. But as you say, you know, basically kind of when the thread of the sweater kind of gets pulled, people are going to go, hmm, how does this work? And, uh, you know, that, how much do you want to pay attention to those kind of elements? Yeah, I, I think it's – the problem is that we get the time horizons, and Anthony and I have talked about this a lot. The time horizons, depending on the perspective, change dramatically. So <laughs> if you're a CEO, a lot of times you're thinking five, ten years down the road, whereas a lot of these boards or investors are thinking two to three years down the road. And the decision process for making that two to three year uh, action is a lot different than the, four, the five to ten year because when you're talking about five to ten year planning, you're talking about near-term pain. <laughs> when you're talking about two to three ter year planning, that's long-term pain mm -hmm. uh, that you're potentially setting yourself up for. Yeah, uh, along the same lines. Yeah, I mean, and it, it 
drastically different if you're public or private, right? Sure, I mean, yeah. if, mm -hmm. And you look at private equity and VC, their time horizon, it, it goes in the same thing. It's just a little longer, right? They're looking for exits in five, seven, 10 years, as opposed to on the public side, that two to three. And this is where setting those expectations up during this is so vital to a CEO being effective. Mm -hmm. And it's not just shareholders, it's also to employees and making sure everybody understands what's going on, being that kind of, I wanna say prominent figurehead, but I mean, being able to lead both sides and making sure everybody on both sides understands the same message and it, that's what gets accomplished. Yeah, so and, and I think you have to be a master in that area of company preservation versus self-preservation there as well. And where do you marry that line in terms of, I mean, this can be different for everybody because obviously some boards are more aggressive, some are less aggressive, shareholders can be more aggressive or less aggressive, but what do you take that temperature, do you pay attention to that a lot as a CEO just to make sure that A, the company's doing, you know, achieving goals, but also you're not working yourself into a situation where you could be the enemy of your shareholders? I think you have to, I mean, it's a fine line. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you do have to kind of take that into account. I mean, especially if you look in this case where you've had an activist investor kind of step in, start buying up shares. I mean, you look at Encore is getting their seats on the board. You're, you're trying to, those steps were already being kind of in place, right? Mm -hmm. That's where you have to really start to focus on it, like the shareholders in this case are important because they are trying to step in and make changes and they are making those changes. I mean, so it's, but you also don't want to back yourself into a corner and it's almost, it kind of felt like that maybe what happened in this situation, especially when you see how quickly things shifted and it's like, we saw it here. We talked about mm -hmm. it. It's, it's, did you pay attention broadly to what's going on uh, in the market and Obviously, other people, I mean, your shareholders are doing the same thing, right? They're all looking at the same data because they'll understand if, hey, we knew things were going bad, they'll give you a little leeway. But if you were kind of turned a blind eye and that's where things get a little fuzzy. Gotcha. Um, Zach, let me turn back to you here. Uh, you know, going back to the avalanche uh, scenario, the avalanche analogy here, are there susceptible industries that really, really need to be careful with this, especially, you know, the, the longer or the harder this gets, uh, especially in freight, but are there industries that really, and CEOs that really need to be careful moving forward here? Yeah, anybody, anybody in consumer, like exposed to consumer demand. I mean, there is zero, Craig and I talked about this on our uh, state of freight year in review. Uh, uh, there is no stimulus event on the horizon, period. It yeah. all looks relatively doom and gloom for the consumer uh, for the next foreseeable future. So anybody in retail, uh, CPG, uh, all these you know, durable goods producers, uh, companies that heavily rely on, you know, these Walmarts, Targets, things like that, these retail centric. Now, Walmart tends to be a little bit better set up because they're a discount provider, but anybody operating off of these premium goods, a little bit more exposed uh, to what we're going to see here, economically speaking, over the next 12 months. Now, that being said, anybody that handles the downstream impacts, automotive, for instance, uh, very heavily exposed to the consumer erosion uh, ability to purchase goods. Uh, however, they're getting a little bit of a lag, so they're not necessarily seeing the full brunt of the force just yet. And my thought there is that uh, they're going to need to be able to ramp down uh, production when they see these things start to take place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and I mean, just to the automotive front, I mean, you look at the issues that they've had. I mean, you've chips and all those, the shortages, mm -hmm. right? They've been trying to ramp up production yeah. just to catch up. So it's it's this give and take, this ability, the ones that can flow with consumer demand, those are the ones that are, are really successful no matter what's going on in the macro economic conditions. Yeah, it's flexibility. The, flexibility yeah. is the key to uh, inoculating volatility. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so any other uh, industries that he didn't mention that you think may be susceptible to this thing? No, I think, I mean, I think he hit the nail on the head. I think, I mean, other ones, I mean, you've kind of seen it. I mean, you look at lumber prices and things like that. I mm -hmm. mean, you start dealing with interest rates are really elevated. What you're seeing costs come down, you're going to have issues. I mean, it goes into the durable goods because if you think, you're gonna see a slowdown in housing. Yeah. I mean, you're already seeing it happen. Mm -hmm. It's going to get cheaper to build, 
-hmm. because prices are coming down. I mean, obviously rates are still high, but yeah. it makes it more competitive. New builds are where a lot of those durable goods go into, especially when you think about it. I mean, you're buying new appliance, all new appliances in houses. I mean, so I think that's an area. I think he hit the nail on the head. The, anything consumer <laughs> facing is just going it, to, it just doesn't, the outlook's not great. It, okay. It's hard to see a positive one. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you both this, kind of wrap things up. Let's say you're the CEO of a company. What are your biggest indicators, indices, numbers you're looking at? Uh, what are what are the number? What are the things that CEOs need to watch? What's your toolkit uh, for for trying to navigate these tough times? I, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm a little biased because sure. I look at I look at sonar data all the time. Uh, but our tender volume index obviously does probably the single best job of any indicator that we have of mm -hmm. reflecting demand side fluctuations. Um, and that tells me not only what you know consumers are doing, but it mm -hmm. also tells me what other companies are thinking about when they're, when they're shipping goods. When they ship goods, they're sending the rest of the world a signal that, hey, we foresee something changing. Maybe that's triggered by the consumer. Maybe it's triggered by something they know inherently. Um, that to me is one of the biggest uh, triggers for what we're going to see moving forward because demand is going to be the thing to watch, mm -hmm. period, uh, over the next year because everybody's expecting it to trough out here in the coming months, how long that lasts. But as we've seen every single year since 2016, uh, freight volumes, they, they turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. March mm -hmm. this year, that's exactly what we saw first. It wasn't that we saw the future. We just saw things really quickly mm -hmm. in terms of tender volumes and freight movements. Yep. What's uh, in your toolkit? I think, I mean, obviously, same thing. Uh, we look at it <laughs> all the time. Yeah. I mean, you start looking at the ocean too, right? I mean, that's, that's another one of those. I know you've talked about it. It's not necessarily... A, always a forward-looking indicator, mm -hmm. but it does kind of signal some things, right? We, and we're so, we're at such low, I don't want to say low levels, but we're back at 2019 levels. If we see an uptick there, it's a sign, hey, maybe the, it's more of a, hey, this might happen six, eight, nine, 12 months in the future, mm -hmm. not instantaneous. Yeah, yeah, and economic economic indicators tend to be extremely slow, and mm -hmm. a lot of them we found to be very murky. Uh, you know, Anthony and I talk about this all the time. You got to watch out for those because they're they're lag. They've had years of history. Yep but they're not built to be very fast. Yep. Mm -hmm. Of course, you got to watch out for the board that's been <laughs> experiencing some really good years the last yep. couple of years. They would like to see that happen again. It may, of course, not materialize. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here on The Roundtable. We'll take a short break and be back after this. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. 
This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. Welcome back. It's time for fi one final check of top stories up on FreightWaves.com this morning. The European Union ban on Russian seaborne crude imports has been in effect for about a month, but the expected hike to crude tanker rates has not happened yet. Crude tanker rates are actually down double digits since the restrictions went into place, although they remain highly profitable. Clarkson Securities reported Tuesday that spot rates for eco-designed very large crude carriers were $45,600 per day, down 28% month over month. Spot rates for Suez Maxes were $57,800 per day, down 28.6% month over month. Septin, one of the few publicly traded LiDAR companies in the United States, unveiled its newest offering yesterday for real-time adaptive 3D imaging. The Septin sensors are well-suited for use in cars and vans and will be helpful in autonomous vehicle deployment. Its system is so small in size that it can actually be placed in the vehicle during the manufacturing process or after the vehicle is done without affecting the appearance of the vehicle. The sensor will process data at five times the rate of Septin's current LiDAR systems and will increase the view field to 30 more degrees. And the December Logistics Managers Index showed the sharpest rate of contraction for transportation pricing ever during the month. The LMI came in at 36.9 for the month, with the rate of decline the fastest in the six-year history of the index. Transportation utilization fell into contraction for the first time since April of 2020, with a reading of 48.1, while capacity expanded with a reading of 69.5. The report cited full warehouses before the holiday season as one of the reasons for contraction, saying that less transportation was needed to move goods last minute. You can find these stories and so much more up on FreightWaves.com and our FreightWaves app. If you're watching us live on YouTube or on social media, give us a like and subscribe to stay updated. And of course, head on over to TV.FreightWaves.com for more. We're going to toss things back over to the wall. We've got our final carrier update of the morning. Welcome into the final carrier update of the morning, our lanes of the day, Donnie. Obviously, gives her here in Atlanta, seeing obviously really high lead, to lead times on the reefer side. You're seeing, you've got to make sure your reefers turn on, but you're seeing. And rates. I went ahead and added in ROTL. I've been mm -hmm. beating on tender lead times mm -hmm. the last couple of days. I want to continue that. <clears throat> so here we see lead times jump up <coughs> right here for the holidays in Atlanta. Looks like it's pretty hot here. So I pull up Atlanta under the uh, uh, market dashboard. I would come and put Atlanta to Philly. And it pulls up here and you can see, look at this big increase right here. Yep. Up to 3.17 as of yesterday. So this is a lane out of the Southeast that's paying over $3 a mile. Mm -hmm. It's also almost 800 miles. So this is a really good lane for a reefer carry right now. And you're running through a lot of states that have pretty low diesel fuel prices until you hit that Virginia and on into PA mark. That's when your fuel prices are gonna jump. And it's, it almost fits perfectly. If you could put the mirror these, it's about, I mean, you're talking in four-ish days, right? Once those started to pick up, those pickup dates, right? That four day lead time, yep. that's about the same time that the, it's about a four day lag and it matches almost perfectly. So yeah. and that's why it's so important to pay attention to. Yes, and so here, and what Tony was talking about here is, is, is the date here versus the date where this peaks at, mm -hmm. being that about four and a half days, and we see it here, and volatility is one, so we still have a pretty good range here, almost up to 350 a mile yep. on this lane. Now let's check out another lane going into, uh, we'll, we'll go Philadelphia back to Atlanta here, just to see the difference. So here the difference is, this has been going down, and it's at 262. So <clears throat> you probably want to uh, accept uh, if you're in the if you're in the Philly market, you may want to accept more lanes headed south there into the Atlanta area, knowing that you can get a pretty good rate, a very good rate on that backhaul mm -hmm. getting back into the Northeast, coming out of Atlanta, running a reefer right now. Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> All right, next lane, let's run uh, Joliet into Philadelphia. Why to pick Joliet? Again, Joliet showed a pretty huge spike here in their. Uh, uh, outbound tender lead times. I've got it pulled up here in blue here. Uh, and then of course I've got my rate here and you see right here, again, about five day uh, lead time, yep. bam, up to just right at $4 a mile. Yep. And this again, this is a 773 mile run for uh, this lane at $4 a mile. 
That's not a lot that we haven't heard that, Tony, in quite some time. Yep. So this is why I want you to pay attention to this and lead with this. <clears throat> Next chart here. Uh, Philadelphia back to uh, to Juliet at 228. So, you know, I'm almost kind of thinking you might want to run Chicago to Philadelphia, maybe catch your contract to lane Philadelphia down to Atlanta, and then run Atlanta back to Philadelphia, and then maybe contract back to Chicago. This could be a pretty good lane here mm -hmm. for you. And your back hauls, your return rates are pushing that $4 mark. Yeah, right I mean, this $4. is like a little triangle I love looking at because it, it connects basically every major corridor on the east eastern half of the country except Dallas. So, I mean, it, it's pretty important. Yeah, when we come back tomorrow, Tony, we'll look at, we'll do an overall fr freight view, look at OTVI, OTRI, and uh, not really break it down, just kind of get a feel and maybe throw in some, uh, see what's going on uh, about freight that's coming across the pond. Awesome stuff, thank you, Donnie. For the updates this morning, we'll be sure to check in with you again tomorrow. Right now, we'll hand it over to Kaylee and Anthony. All right, guys, thank you for that. And we are done here for your Wednesday. But never to fear, there is lots more coming up on Freight Waves for the rest of your day. That's right. We have What the Truck. And is this going to be the first episode? Of the, the first year? episode of the year. Dooner is back in house, ready to welcome you guys back to What the Truck. Following that, we've got a new Fuller Speed Ahead airing today. Point of sale is a brand new time at 2 p.m. Eastern with Sonar moving up to 3 o'clock because we've got Truck Tech with Alan Adler debuting at 4. That's right. And typically, this is when I would mention the 24 hour-ish clock starting mm -hmm. to count down for Freightonomics, but we're moving to Tuesdays at 2 o'clock, so that's going to be a new time for Freightonomics. Breaking news. You're going to have to wait an extra week to get your freight and econ <laughs> sandwich from Zach and Anthony. That's right, but we, like you said earlier, we have some new times for some new show, mm -hmm. or some new and some returning shows today, so there's plenty more Freight Waves content coming up, and if you haven't done so already, get registered for our next virtual event, which is coming up in just about a week. Absolutely. Plenty to fill your calendar with, so go ahead and get that done. We'll see you guys tomorrow morning starting live at 9 a.m. Have a great rest of your day.
2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. Welcome into this Descartes Insight. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and joining me to talk about how buying with a user-first mentality can lead to success in freight tech is Jesse Carmichael, Senior Product Manager at Descartes. Jesse, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. We're glad to have you, and we are currently experiencing another shift in the tides of the freight market. As a product manager at Descartes, a company with logistics technology adopted across the globe, how should freight tech buyers think about addressing the challenges of a less robust market? Yeah, I think those buyers need to consider their, uh, the people um, that's going to be using that technology. Uh, you want to set them up for success. You want to ensure you uh, see that return on the investment that you're making. Um, a lot of uh, things to consider, things such as maintaining service level expectations, uh, you're going to need that to retain and grow market share in down cycles. Um, also, the tech you're buying, you should have a really good user experience. Uh, that user experience is going to enable more productivity. So you just mentioned user experience. Why does improving your user experience matter so much? Well, for me, I um, was a freight broker in a previous life, and I spent a little over a decade there in that industry. Um, <clears throat> from, you know, it's one of those things where uh, sitting in those seats, experiencing those pain points, um, I think it's important. I know Descartes thinks it's important to have someone with that background, that experience to uh, relay that information to our R&D teams, to our UX teams, um, and really help uh, design a product uh, with a good user experience to facilitate and alleviate some of that pain. Um, you know, the other couple of things you want to think about when you're designing that user experience is you want to make their job easier. Right. Um, if their job is easier, they can get more done in the day. You can remove some of the redundancy. Uh, you can introduce automation where you see fit um, and you can onboard new users uh, with guardrails and replicate success. Do you have any advice for our viewers or things to consider when evaluating a TMS? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important that uh, your TMS should uh, fit your workflows and your needs. Um, I also think it's important that that TMS uh, should have uh, a large uh, pool of integration partners um, that they can access to add and bolt on new tools uh, to provide your users more, uh, more uh, productivity, um, more uh, places to go get data they need, uh, more places to uh, improve efficiencies. Uh, we're seeing a lot of new uh, and exciting tools come onto the market, whether it's for uh, carrier rating, uh, whether it's for, um, you know, sourcing capacity. Uh, visibility is always a uh, top one. So just you want to make sure when you're looking for a TMS that it's compatible with a lot of different uh, vendors and the user experience is something that can be customized. And regarding a new TMS, do you want to share a little bit about why you stopped by today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're very excited here at Descartes. Uh, we're launching our third gen TMS, Algex Live. It's going to be better um, user experience. It's going to be faster, more secure. Uh, we've instituted some uh, really cool features that allow you to customize your day to day uh, workflows, um, even, you know, small details such as being able to change your status colors. So we've really put a lot of time and effort into it, and uh, we would love for everyone to come check it out and get a demo. So if people want more information about Descartes and about Algex Live, where can they go? Yeah, so for Algex uh, Live, you can go to algex.com, and for Descartes, uh, you can go to descartes.com. We offer a, a whole line of different products for the supply chain industry, um, and you can also find us on LinkedIn as well. Jesse, thanks again for joining me for this update. All right, thank you.
into our discussion today with XPO. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and joining me is Diana Brown, Senior Vice President of Sales Operations and Customer Experience. Diana, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me today, Isaiah. I'm pleased to be here. We're really glad to have you, and let's talk about customer satisfaction. It is a key differentiator in today's increasingly competitive market. What are customers demanding from their transportation partners today? Interestingly, customer expectations are very similar. The baseline expectations are deliver my shipment on time, deliver it damage-free, provide a fair price, and make sure you provide an invoice that I can easily pay. Right? So the expectations are the same, but where you start to see some variability is with customer size. So smaller customers that ship out of one or two of our service centers, they're really looking to develop those relationships with our customer service representatives, with our drivers, uh, in person and picking up the phone to, to talk to each other. Large customers that have hundreds of shipments in our network at any time, it's actually the opposite. They're looking to have real-time information and updates in their systems, right? So that's deep technology integration and making sure that we're passing all the information that they need about those hundreds of shipments. So I would say the differentiation really comes based on customer requirements. And how can XPO meet the expectations of their customers? Yeah, again, I would say it starts with the foundation is in our service centers, right? So we've got a thousand customer service representatives in our about 300 service centers because they're closest to the freight. From there, we look at the customer life cycle. So when you sign on with XPO, we start with customer onboarding. What do you need from us? What do you need operationally? What do you need to make sure that we understand about your business? Do you need trailers and part of our equipment? It's that IT integration again. But this becomes a full project management approach for onboarding for our customers to make sure we meet their expectations. And we've really focused on this for about the last three years. And this, Isaiah, is one of our differentiators. We hear that time and time again from our customers. So it's super important to get off on the right foot. And then from there, it's all about, again, understanding the customer's needs. So we have a few customer uh, teams here that act as extensions of the customer's transportation teams themselves. So think about a large consumer packaged goods company that needs to have uh, returns managed. We do that work for them. And on the flip side, if you think about in retail, vendors needing to get their product so that it can get on the shelves in a holiday season like now, we'll actually manage all those vendor pickups, call, make sure they're ready, make sure that uh, they're ready for us to pick up. So, so someone at our customer doesn't have to do that. So we're working with them daily, weekly, and, and acting as just extending their team. So ultimately, we want to listen to our customers, make it super easy to do business with XPO. And to make it super easy to do business with XPO, you have to have people. They're a key component to customer experience. How do you keep your team motivated to ensure a culture of quality? Yeah, quality is job number one at XPO. It really is. It's woven into the fabric uh, and all the way into our compensation plans, I would say. Uh, but for me, it's really thinking about recognition, rewards, and developing your employees. So from a recognition and rewards perspective, we have it on our operations side with something called the Gladiator Program. So we're always looking at you know, moving freight through the network damage free. And those can be t-shirts and patches and hats and, and medals. And you can go into our service centers and see the pride when they're all hanging each month those service center gets those awards. Similarly, with our customer service representatives, a lot of recognition, formal and informal program, whether it's on our XPO Go app or on our internal websites or just email, letting people know the great job that has been done and, and recognizing that and rewarding and also developing. It's uh, LTL can be pretty complicated and so things can go wrong. When they go wrong, we want to swiftly resolve problems. So we've got a certification program for our customer service representatives that has four key pillars. The first one being simply fundamentals of customer service. Second one focused on the operational systems. The third one focusing on kind of the rating and the billing side. And then uh, also just some of the things that happen, making sure drivers are ready and all their information that they need. So making sure we're developing and teaching our employees is super important. Uh, but we know it's working with our feedback loops. We listen to customers all the time, and we've got multiple ways we do that. But each week, we're getting one to 200 responses from a survey that tell us what's working, what's not, and where we need to course correct. So that's how you really make sure the quality is happening. 
XPO has really always been at the forefront of industry innovation. How are you integrating technology into your customer experience? Yeah, so technology is super important at XPO. Uh, I'm a tech geek at heart. My first job was coding. I've always reported to Mario Herrick, who was our CIO. So, you know, technology for our customers is super important to us as well. Customers don't always see it, though. It's not always customer facing. A lot of what we're doing is to improve the quality or improve their experience uh, without the tools that they interact with. But let's start with the tools they interact with. Our website, we're continuing to upgrade, add capabilities, make sure we have real-time information so shipment visibility is super easy, right? And, and how do we get that in front of customers uh, just in the way they want to consume it? So that's you know one of the things we're working on, continuing to upgrade our website, even adding things like paying invoices, payment portals, those kinds of things, You know, making it more consumer-like, frankly. Uh, so that's a, that's a big effort for us and we'll continue. Uh, some of the other efforts are behind the scenes, as I mentioned. So even simple things like how you look at your phone systems and how you think about being more proactive based on phone time and where you're getting, uh, how long it's taking to answer phones and those kinds of things. And just making sure you're using that in a very proactive way so you're able to get a great customer experience there. Um, but probably the most impactful uh, example that I can give you of brand new technology that we've de developed in the last six months is an internal tool asked for by our operations team. So you have thousands of trailers moving through our network every day, being touched by lots of different service centers. And they wanted to rate each other and start to gamify it a little bit and, and to see where we were doing well and where we had opportunities to improve. So our tech team developed a, a quick little app, got it out there, and uh, there were three-star ratings and one time in the trailer, and that's moved to five-star ratings and rating multiple times in the trailer. But what's super important is getting this feedback back to our supervisors so they can talk to dock workers about where we can make improvements. And, and I guarantee you that in the past six months, our quality has improved significantly as a result of this application. So that, that's probably one of the most fun ones and just something that the team did quickly and turned around and made a big impact. And it certainly seems like XPO is one collective or hive mind that's working so that they can better the customer experience for your customers. And it seems like it's really helping XPO to grow their business. Thank you for taking the time and joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Welcome into this technology update presented by DHL Supply Chain. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and I'm joined by Stefan Shablinski, the Vice President of Go Green, and Ted Vallon, the Senior Director of Asset and Management. Gentlemen, how are you doing? Doing well, thank, good, you. thank you. It seems DHL Supply Chain is really focused on investing in and developing a variety of new technologies. I've seen your recent announcements about autonomous forklifts, Locust Robotics, and autonomous trucks. And you're here today to talk about electric vehicles. So what are you doing with that technology and what are your plans? Stefan, I'll let you start things off. Yes, thanks, that's a great question. So electric vehicles are a key technology for us to reach our carbon reduction targets. The targets as it relates to our own fleet is to make sure that at least 30% of our own fleet uh, will be electric trucks or another alternative to um, fossil fuel diesel trucks. So that's an important technology for us. And for us, it's important to understand how to deploy this new technology in the future, which is why we started a pilot earlier this year. So why did you choose this pilot program? How is this going to help with the timeline of your electric vehicles? Sure, I can take that one. Um, as as Stefan mentioned, we're shooting for uh, at least 30% of our fleet to be near zero carbon emission by 2030. That's part of a larger DHL, a DHL goal over an even longer span of time. We started a pilot of with one electric truck uh, that one of our suppliers provided for us to use in one of our operations as a starting point. Once we proved that, um, that it would work in our operations, we wanted to take on a larger pilot. So we are in process process of putting 12 to 13 electric trucks in operation in about six or seven of our sites across the country in a number of different terrains and climates and types of um, transportation operations to really test that out and to learn a lot of the things that make, um, you know, make EVs a little bit more complicated than the diesel trucks. And we expect to take those learnings and then leverage it for a continued rollout 
toward that overall 30% target that we have. Stefan, what would you say is the motivation for the pilot project? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for us, we believe that it's really important to be one of the early adopters to learn as much as we can to be able to, to bring this technology to, to scale in the future. Um, we understand now that it's quite a challenge to deploy electric vehicles, but we believe that it requires a lot of learning and also changing processes, upscaling people in our organization to figure out how to deploy electric vehicles in the future, almost like a standard way of, of doing uh, business in the future. So where are you with that timeline? Are you still lining up EV OEMs and evaluating technologies? Do you have any pilot projects right now? Yes, we are. We are um, we're making a lot of progress. We started earlier this year in earnest, um, first selecting the actual OEMs that we wanted to work with, um, evaluating our site operating profiles to figure out where EVs could be a fit based on the mileage range and a number of other factors. You have to evaluate charge time available and some other things like that, payload constraints. There are also some considerations around um, available incentives that help um, bring the cost down. So we've made all those evaluations. Uh, we've all selected, also selected some providers to assist us with implementing the charging infrastructure. Uh, so that was another round of activity to identify those providers we wanted to work with. Um, and then they went out and performed site surveys to determine the specific infrastructure requirements. And so now we're at the point of kicking off the construction related to the, the installation of that infrastructure. At the same time, finalizing plans to actually take delivery of the electric trucks. Um, there also are work streams around preparing to train drivers because driving an electric truck is different than driving a diesel truck. So a lot of simultaneous things going on, um, and we're really tapping into a cross-functional team within DHL, across operations, our Go Green team, our facilities team, and others, um, as well as tapping into uh, an external network of providers to help accelerate the pilot and um, you know, really bring other learnings to the table. You bring up a good point. Most of the technologies you are commercializing are used within warehouses and distribution centers. Electric trucks will be used on the roads. What added challenges does that bring? Yeah, to Ted's point, I think for us it's really important to figure out the differences between electric trucks and diesel trucks, and there are a lot of differences. I mean, uh, no one thinks about fueling infrastructure for diesel trucks. Um, all of this is available. I mean, this this uh, market has had decades to build an infrastructure that is built for diesel trucks, 